Hello, and welcome to pre-college math week number 13. Boy, the time is flying. This week, we're going to be talking about sequences and series. In mathematics, the word sequence is used in much the same way it is in ordinary English. Saying that a collection is listed in sequence means that it is in order so that it has a first member, a second member, a third member, and so on. Two examples are one, two, three, four, one, three, five, seven. Mathematically, you can think of a sequence as a function whose domain is a set of positive integers. Rather than using function notation, however, sequences are usually written using subscript notation as indicated in the following definition. Definition of a sequence. An infinite sequence is a function whose domain is a set of positive integers. The function values are a sub one, a sub two, a sub three, a sub four, dot, 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 to a sub n are the terms of the sequence when the domain of a function consists of the first n positive integers only the sequence is a finite sequence so we can have an infinite sequence we can have a finite sequence infinite means it goes on forever finite means it has a specific number of terms in the sequence on occasion it is convenient to begin subscripting a sequence with zero instead of one so that the terms of the sequence becomes a sub zero, a sub one, a sub two, a sub three. When this is the case, the domain includes zero. Usually we start with one, but sometimes we do use zero. The first four terms of the sequence, a sub n equals three n minus two. All you're really doing is you're just plugging in one, two, three. So a sub one, which would be written this way, means that we put one in for n. So three times one is three minus two, that gives me one. So a sub one is one. A sub two, this little subscript means it is the second term. So I put two in here. Three times two is six minus two is four. And you can, if I wanted to say, well, it is a sub 100, you would just put 100 in here. Three times 100 is 300 minus two is 298. So it's very easy to find any term of a sequence if they give you the nth term. And this is what is called the nth term. It's really the formula for the function. The first four terms of the sequence given by a sub n equals three plus negative one to the n. Well, negative one to the n, if you put one in there, negative one to the first power is negative one. So three plus negative one is two. Then if you put two in there, negative one to the second power is positive one, so three plus one, and this is just gonna go back and forth because you're just changing. This is gonna either be negative one or positive one, and it just keeps changing. So my sequence is two, four, two, four, on and on and on. Simply listing the first few terms in it is not sufficient to define a unique sequence. The nth term must be given, because if you take a look here, I've got one half, one fourth, one eighth. The first, if I just listed the first three terms here and I list the first three terms here, it seems like the sequence is exactly the same. But now the next term is 1 16th, here it's 1 15th. Look at the difference. This is my nth term for this sequence. And this is my nth term for this sequence. The first three terms looks like it's exactly the same, but then it kind of deviates big time. So you have to have the nth term in order to um, define a sequence. Find the third term of the sequence. Well, put three in there. Eight times three is 24 plus nine is 33. Boom. That was a pretty easy practice problem. Hopefully they're all this easy this week. Find the fourth term of the sequence. Well, if I put four in here, that gives me one seventh. Oh, they're all gonna be this easy this week. Hmm, no, not really. These are called uh, explicit. Now we're gonna talk about a recursively defined sequence, okay? Before, they those were called explicit formulas. Now we're gonna talk about recursive. Some sequences are defined recursively. To define a sequence recursively, you need to be given one or more of the first few terms. All other terms of a sequence are then defined using the previous term. Ooh, this one's kind of weird. Okay, so for example, if I said a sub n is equal to two times a sub n minus one, all right? And I then I told you a sub one is equal to 10. Okay, so that's my first term. They, they have to tell you what your first term is. So what this is saying is, if I wanna find the next term, if I wanna find a sub two, then I go two times a sub two minus one, 
two minus one is one. So basically it's saying, hey, use the previous term to get the next term. So I just multiply the, net, the previous term by two. So my second term would be a sub or 20. Then it would go 40 because then I would use the previous term to that. So recursively you're finding the pre, you have to use the previous term to get to the next term. Now this one is tough because if they ask me to find a sub 100, uh, I can't just plug 100 in here. I have to find every single term up to 100. That's why we don't use recursively to find functions very often because they're not very nice to use. You can't find, like if it's an explicit formula, you can find, if I asked you to find a sub 100, no problem, you just plug 100 in, you get the term. But recursively, you need the 99th term to find the 100th term. So it's not as easy to use. So in this problem, it says a recursive formula always has two parts, the starting value for the first term, a sub zero, they, they can give you a sub one, I usually use a sub one, the recursion, the recursion equation for a sub n of the function of a sub n minus one, which just means a sub n minus one just means the previous term. That's why so many kids, they, they mess up. It's like, you know, when you see a sub n minus one, the first thing you should be thinking is, oh, the previous term. So in this problem, it says, consider the sequence given by a sub n equals two times a sub n minus one plus one with a sub zero equals four. So basically they gave me the first term. Then to find the next term, I have to multiply the previous term by two and then add one. So two times four is eight plus one is nine. So the next term is nine. Then I do the same thing, to multiply the previous term by two. So that gives me 18 plus one, that gives me 19. Then I keep doing that. And they have them written down right here. Okay, so, and then if they want to find a sub 10, uh, it's a pain because I've got to find a sub four, a sub five, a sub six, a sub seven, a sub eight. So that's a recursive formula. What is the fifth term of the recursive um, sequence defined by a sub one is five. Okay, so I know my first term. So I need the second, third, fourth, fifth, because they want to know what the fifth term is. A sub n is equal to three times a, ah, a sub n is equal to three times a sub n minus one. So basically it's saying that um, this is the previous term, right? So to get the next term, you have to multiply the previous term by three. So five times three is 15. 15 times three is, is that 45? And then I could just keep multiplying by three to get the next term. Okay, so that was a pretty easy one to find the next terms. So here's a, Practice problem, it says, find the third term of the recursively defined function. So this one, it says a sub n is equal to six, a sub n minus one minus six. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, and a sub one is eight. So I know my first term is eight. What am I looking for, the third? All right, so to, to get the, the second term, I put eight in here. So eight minus six is two, two times six is 12. Okay, so that's 12. So now I have to put 12 in here. So 12 minus six is six, six times six is 36. So the third term is 36. Find the fourth term of the recursively defined sequence. Oh, fourth term. Uh, all right. So the first term is five. Second, third, fourth. So I have to go one over five plus five. So that's, oh no, this is gonna be nasty. <laughs> Oh no, I'm gonna let you guys finish this one because I'm, I'm looking at this and it's like, oh my goodness, I've already got five one-tenth and then I have to put one-tenth here to get my next term. And then I have to, oh yeah, you guys can finish that one off. No, oh, I should take that one off the practice. I'm gonna have to do it on, on Monday, yikes. All right, the next thing that we have to talk about is factorial notation. So for example, five factorial, does anybody know what that means? A factorial just means that you multiply that number. So five factorial really means five times four times three times two times one. If I asked you for 10 factorial, that means 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. I love giving this type of problem to students. I love giving them like 100 factorial over 98 factorial and having them try to figure that out. Well, if you really think about it, 100 factorial is 100 
times 99 times 98 times 97 times 96, and I'm not going to go any farther. I know it's going to go all the way down to one, right? But then 98 factorial is right here, 98 times 97 times 96. So when you think about it, all of these are going to cross off. The only thing you really have to multiply is right here, because that's all that will be left over when you multiply all that out. That is an awesome factorial problem. I love those. <laughs> so you probably see something like that on the on the assessment. So here's the definition for a factorial. Um, notice that zero factorial is equal to one and one factorial is equal to one. It's kind of weird, but it's the way it is. So zero factorial is one, one factorial is also one. Now, if you have two n factorial, this is not the same thing as this, okay? That factorial only goes on the, the n. So if I had two times five factorial, that's not the same thing as two times five factorial, okay? This would be two times five times four times three times two times one, and this would be 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five. See the difference? So make sure you understand where those parentheses are and where the factorial is. If the factorial is just on the end or if it's on the whole thing. If there's parentheses, it's on the whole thing. If it's not, then it's just on that number. Write the first five terms of the sequence given by a sub n is equal to, ay, okay, the first five terms, and they want us to begin with zero. Okay, so I put zero in here. So two to the zero over zero factorial. Well, two to the zero is one. Zero factorial is one. So my first term is one. My second term, I put two in there. Now, I'm sorry, I put one in there because we started with zero. Okay, so I have to put one in there. So two to the first is two. One factorial is one, so that would be two. Then if I put two in here, that's gonna be four. Two factorial is just two. Oh, that's two again. And if I go, and you can, I think I have it all figured out here. All right, so we end up with two. A sub two is gonna be two. And then if we put three in there, we're gonna end up with four thirds. If we put four in there, we're gonna end up with two thirds. When working with factorials, fractions involving factorials, you will often be able to reduce the fractions to simplify the computations. Summation notation. All right, summation notation is, this is a symbol for, anytime you see that, you should be thinking about sum. And the number, let's say I, I give you n equals one to five. This tells you where to start. This tells you where to stop. And then they'll give you uh, a sequence. So let's just say two n. Okay, so basically it's saying plug one in here. So two times one is two plus, and then put two in here. Two times two is four plus, and you put three in there. Three, two times three is six plus, and you put four in there, you get eight, then you put five in there and you get 10, and then you stop because we just went from one to five and you count by ones as you go up. So you go one, two, three, four, five, and then we work this out. So two, that's six, 12, 20, okay. So this answer would be 30. That is summation notation. And then it's written out in better forms here mathematical terms. So if I gave you a problem like this, uh, fairly similar to what we just had. 3i, and I start with one here, so I put that in, so I get three, plus six, plus nine, plus 12, plus 15. Here, now it's telling me that I start with three, so I plug three in here. So one plus three squared, well, that's 10, isn't it? And if I put four in there, one plus four squared, that's 17. Now if I put five in there, one plus 25 is 26. If I put six in here, uh, one plus 36 is 37. And if I add it up, I end up with 90. So summation notation, it, it looks really scary, but all it is is you're just adding the, the, the terms up. Okay, and then they will put factorials in there and then it gets to be really interesting. All right, and then we, the last thing that we have to talk about this week is series. We just talked about sequences. Now a series 
Uh, many af applications involve the sum of the terms of a finite or infinite uh, sequence, such a sum is called a series. So if we're talking about a series, it means that we're going to add up all the terms. Okay, so for example, if they gave us something like this, for the series, um, i is equal to 1 to infinity. Oh, no. <laughs> infinity? How am I going to keep adding all these numbers up? But if you take a look at the solution, if you plug in, oh, this one just says 1 to 3. I don't know where the infinity came from, because if I added up 1 to 3, it's just going to be 0 0.3333. We'll change this to a, a three here because that makes it a whole lot easier to do. Infinity. Mm -mm, we're not talking about those until next week. All right. That is it for this week. I hope to see you guys on Monday. You guys have a great week. Mm -hmm, bye.